Welcome back. We're now on 7.6, molecular, molecular structure and polarity. So in this section, we're going to predict the structures of small molecules using valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, explain the concepts of polar covalent bonds and molecular polarity, and assess the polarity of a molecule based on its bonding and structure. So I want to stress here that this is all for covalent compounds. We are not talking about ionic compounds in this section. So first we need to talk a little bit about structures. We've been drawing Lewis structures for molecular compounds and, and at first glance it kind of seemed like something with four bonds kind of is flat and has four right angles, but in reality molecular structures are not two dimensional. They are three dimensional and they have bond angles associated with them. And this is the angle between any two bonds that have a common atom. So for instance, down here at the bottom, uh, this is formaldehyde. You have a bond angle between these two hydrogens, okay, or these two bonds here, where there's a carbon in the center. So this is a bond angle and it is measured in degrees. Bond length is the distance between the nuclei of two bonded atoms along the straight line that joins them. Okay, and we have two ways of measuring them. We have angstroms, which is this little A with the circle on top of it. That represents 10 to the negative 10 meters, or picometers, they're cute, which one picometer is 10 to the negative 12 meters, or 100 picometers is equal to one angstrom. So an example of bond length is this between this carbon and oxygen. This would be the bond length, and it's 1.21 angstroms. So we use valence shell electron pair repulsion theory, otherwise known as VSEPR theory, to predict the molecular structure. Um, and so this takes into account bond angles around a central atom, and these we can predict based on the number of bonds and lone electron pairs in a Lewis structure. So what this is, is the electrons that are in the valence shell of some central atom. So it's got all these bonds, so the electrons are being shared. And the electrons are going to rearrange themselves. So their repulsion between each other is minimized and the distance between the electrons themselves are maximized. They want to stay as far away from each other as possible. And so we have the smallest repulsion or electrostatic repulsion when we have these high electron density areas, so our bonds and lone pairs that are as far away from each other as possible. An example is beryllium difluoride, BEF2. And when this forms, what ends up happening, this one doesn't necessarily follow the octet, but we end up with this central beryllium and it has these two single bonds to fluorine. And to get as far away from each other as possible, they are going to go 180 degrees apart. So straight apart on opposite ends of the atom to form a linear um, structure. And there's different um, types of structures and ways of representing them. So you do need to be able to identify uh, the electron pair geometries. And there's more to the story than just this. Uh, right now we're focusing on the electrons around a central atom. So if you have two regions of electron density, so either bonds or unshared pairs of electrons. So you have a central atom, maybe it has uh, I mean, it, and it only has two regions. So maybe, I don't know, a pair, a lone pair and one bond. And this could be a triple bond. It could be a double bond. It doesn't matter how many bonds. It's just an electron dense region. So you could have something like, you know, the nitrile. This. Okay. Um, that's an example this triple bond, this represents one region of electron density, okay? So you have two regions of electron density. 
this is going to be linear and this has a line dash wedge notation in this case it's just lines of your central atom and then two bonds on opposite sides of each other if you have three regions of electron density so this could be something like boron trihydride or the formaldehyde we looked at where you had C double bond O and these two hydrogens, they are going to take on a trigonal planar um, geometry. So this is a bond angle of about 120 degrees to get that minimal repulsion, maximum distance. So this is called trigonal planar. And again, that double bond between the carbon and oxygen is just considered one region of electron density. When you have four regions of electron density, so four single bonds or three single bonds and a lone pair of electrons, it doesn't matter what, this is called a tetrahedral electron pair geometry. And this is now going into a notation you may not have seen before, where we have wedges and dashes in our uh, 3D somewhat structure. So you have the spatial arrangement, but when you're trying to draw it on paper and you want to try to represent th a 3D notation, we use this wedge dash notation. And the wedge, which are the ones that are filled in, represents um, the atom there on the other side of it, so this hydrogen is coming out of the page. Okay, so it's coming towards you. Whereas the dash hydrogen is going away from you, going into the page. And the ones that are on just the regular bond, these are just on the page. So that's what those wedges and dashes represent. And this goes for any of the structures. If you see a wedge, it's coming at you. If you see a dash, it's going away from you. So when we have five regions of high electron density, so bonds or unshared pairs again, we have trigonal bipyramidal. So these have angles of either 90 degrees or 120 degrees, depending on where the atoms are attached. If they are equatorial, that means they're in the plane. So that would be these guys here. Okay, that's equatorial equator. They are 120 degrees. And then if they are above or below this triangle, if you will, this triangle here, these are axial. So you have axial and equatorial. And the last electron pair structure or arrangement is when you have six regions of de electron density, then you have an octahedral geometry. All the angles are 90 degrees or 180 degrees. So 180 degrees would be if you have like four lone pairs of electrons. That would give it kind of a um, 180 degree. But we won't worry about that quite yet. So make sure you are able to tell me the angles and the names of these electron region geometries. Which brings me to an extra credit code word. Hello to my watchers. The code word here is, I'm debating if I want to make it kind of silly or related to the material. We'll do it based off of Sprite's nickname. Code word on your extra credit for to put in the extra credit is chicken mouse. That is my now six month old kitten's her Sprite's nickname. Code word chicken mouse. Moving on. 
So that was electron pair geometry. Um, and it is not the same as molecular structure. So the electron pair geometry looks at the, all the electron pairs around a central atom, whether in a bond or as lone pairs around the atom. Molecular structure describes the atom location. So it focuses on at atomic placement. So the actual atoms in your molecule and how they're arranged. They are the same if there's no lone electron pairs around an atom, because then the atoms that are bonded to our central atom are going to follow along with the electrons that they're sharing with your central atom. And there actually are some orders of repulsion and space that's occupied uh, by electron pairs because some um, have higher repulsion than others. Um, some of them take up more space than others. So they kind of mess with those bond angles that we talked about. So the bond angles that we just finished talking about are strictly for electron pair geometry. But when we start looking into molecular geometry, our molecular structure, molecular shape, things can get a little funky because of lone pairs and double and triple bonds messing with things. So when it comes to repulsion of electron pairs, lone pair, lone pair interaction is the strongest. Then lone pair bonding pairs are the next and bonding pair, bonding pair repulsion is the least strongest. When it comes to space, lone pairs take up the most amount of space, followed by triple bonds, then double bonds, and then single bonds. Or I'm sorry, lone pairs take up the most space. Um, so they're the largest triple bonds, then are the second largest, followed by double bonds, and single bonds are the smallest. And that kind of makes sense, right? Uh, those lone pairs, they really don't want to be by anything. They want, and they want all the space to kind of occupy and interact with the um, just everything around them. The triple bond, that's a total of six electrons being shared. That's going to take a lot of space. And then we're doing less and less electrons as we go down. So this is an example of methane. And when we first talked about this for electron density, there were four regions of electron density, giving it a tetrahedral electron pair geometry. And because there are no lone pairs around this carbon, it also has a tetrahedral molecular structure. And this also shows you that wedge dash notation again. So this guy has tetrahedral electron pair geometry and molecular structure. Now, like I was saying, lone pairs and multiple bonds or double or triple bonds can kind of mess with the actual bond angles. So for example, ammonia. So these are all representing ammonia, which is, has a formula of NH3. Its Lewis structure is this guy here. And if we wanted to draw it with a wedge dash notation, it might look something like this. Okay, where you've got that 3D structure, um, one hydrogen coming out, one going in. So this has a tetrahedral electron pair geometry. Okay, because you have four electron regions around that nitrogen. But then, so that's from A, but the actual molecular structure is called trigonal pyramidal, and we'll look more at those in the next slide. So the lone pairs, they're not an atom, so they're not actually taking up a 3D space per se, but they're repelling those other single bonds around the nitrogen. So this gives it a trigonal pyramidal molecular structure. And then the bond angles end up slightly deviating because that lone pair takes up more space over the nitrogen. So it ends up changing the hydrogen, nitrogen, hydrogen bond angle. So this bond here, instead of being 
109.5 like it is if there were all atoms around the nitrogen, it decreases it slightly to 106.8 degrees. So you see a slight deviation there because of the space that those lone pairs of electrons take up. So this is probably going to be your most helpful chart. The first chart we looked at for electron pair geometry is good, but this one covers both because there is overlap between them. So when there are no lone pairs of electrons present, the electron pair geometry is the same as the molecular structure. So that's this first column here. Linear, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, trigonal bipyramidal or bipyramid, and octahedral. But once you start adding lone pairs, we start changing our structure. We do one lone pair, and notice there's Nothing here for two electron regions after the first one, okay? Linear is linear. But when we have three electron regions and one of them is a lone pair of electrons, you have what is called a bent structure or you can also call this angular. Four electron regions with one lone pair is trigonal pyramid or trigonal pyramidal. Five regions with one lone pair is called sawhorse or seesaw. I like seesaw better. It's cuter. And then uh, one lone pair with six regions is square pyramidal or square pyramid. And this also gives you your bond angles. Notice on seesaw, the equatorial bond angle is less than 120 degrees, whereas the axial now is less than 90. So now we're deviating from those ideal bond angles. When we have two lone pairs, four electron regions, we have a bent structure or angular structure. T-shape for five regions and square planar for six regions. Three lone pairs for five regions, we have a linear structure. And for six, we have T-shape. Four lone pairs is only for six regions and this is a linear structure for molecular structure. So this is a really good piece of information to have and maybe have it next to you or on another tab when you're taking your exam because I can guarantee you there will be some questions on this. And this is the book trying to give you um, a visual on a uh, trigonal bipyramidal structure. Um, so it shows again where the equatorial versus axial positioning are. Um, so equatorial, again, these are the ones on this triangle here. And the axial is on the top and bottom. Um, and when you're doing these structures, sometimes, for instance, this is chlorine trifluoride. There are different arrangements that could possibly happen. Um, when, when you have lone pairs and whatnot uh, on chlorine, and those are represented by the red lines. Um, but the T-shaped structure in B is the one that we see because those lone pairs want the equatorial position so they have the bigger um, molecular angles, so they have more room. All right. So we do have a procedure for uh, predicting uh, electron pair geometry and molecular structure. The first step, do the Lewis structure. The second, look at your regions of electron density. So find your lone pairs and your bonds that are around the central atom. And remember that single, double, triple bonds, those each are only one region. So then you can identify your electron pair geometry and from there use the number of lone pairs to determine the molecular structure. And remember that the lone pairs occupy more space than multiple bonds do. And trigonal bipyramidal has lone pairs in the equatorial position. Octahedral with two lone pairs has the lone pairs on opposite sides of the central atom. So just some little rules to keep in mind. And we're going to go through some examples that will hopefully help clear this up and you guys will understand it better. 
So I know I definitely struggled struggled with Vesper theory when I was an undergrad, um, and I've taught it multiple times, but it's not an easy thing to grasp. So please, if it feels confusing, know you're not alone. Vesper theory is a B-I-T-C-H. So let's look at some examples. We want to predict the electron pair geometry and molecular structure for carbon dioxide and boron trichloride. So first thing to do is draw the Lewis structures. So starting with carbon monoxide, okay, I'm kind of skipping going over the actual Lewis structures, went over it quite a lot last week, so hopefully you guys are good on that. So carbon monoxide has a Lewis structure like this, and we notice there are two electron dense regions around the carbon. And so that means we have a linear structure. This is both a linear electron pair and molecular structure. Okay, you can see that in the table too. There's only two electron pairs here. Okay, I think it's better to say electron density regions um, because that dou each double bond represents one region. Boron trichloride, step one, Lewis structure. Step two, figure out our electron density regions, and we have one, two, three regions. No lone pairs around the central angle, or central atom, excuse me. So that means this guy has a trigonal planar. Electron pair geometry. And since there's no lone pairs, that is also its molecular structure. And no lone pairs are on the central atom. So remember, we are focusing on the central atom. We don't care about electron pairs on the outside atoms. And then if we wanted to redraw it to show its uh, 3D structure, you could redraw it like this guy down here. Next example, we want to do this for the ammonium cation. Ammonium is NH4 with a positive charge. So step one, draw the Lewis structure. Step two, figure out the electron dense regions. And we have four single bonds around the nitrogen. And there are no lone pairs. So since there are four electron dense areas, that means we have a tetrahedral structure tetrahedral electron pair geometry. No lone pairs, I mean, that's also its molecular structure. And then if you were to redraw it to reflect that 3D nature of it, that's what it would look like. Water is the next one. So water... Lewis structure looks like this guy, and we see around the oxygen we have four electron dense regions. So that means it has a tetrahedral electron pair geometry. But we have two sets of lone pairs on the oxygen. So this is our first one where we have a different molecular structure. And if we look at our table, four electron areas. Two lone pairs, this is a bent molecular structure. So water has a bent structure. And over on the side, you can kind of see what, what they're going for here with the oxygen in the center and the two lone pairs. That's these red lines here taking up two corners of this pyramid for the tetrahedral pyramid and then the two hydrogens on the other corners. So if you wanted to redraw water to reflect its bent nature, you might see it drawn like this. Sometimes I just do that by habit before I even talk about Lewis structures. Um, it might also be drawn like this for what, using wedge dash. Next, sulfur tetrafluoride. So there's its Lewis structure. Notice it does not obey the octet rule, so make sure you're paying attention for, for that. And we notice around the sulfur we have one, two, three, four, five electron dense areas. So that means we have a trigonal bipyramidal geometry or electron pair geometry.
And then our lone pair of electrons want to go on the equatorial position. That's where it has the larger bond angle. So that one lone pair then goes on the equatorial. And then we're going to fill in our equatorial with our fluorines. And then we have two axial fluorines. And having four single bonds with one lone pair. This gives us the seesaw shape for our molecular shape. Next example, we want to do this for xenon tetrafluoride. So Lewis structure, as you see there, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six electron dense regions. So this means we have an octahedral electron pair geometry. And then the lone pairs want to go on opposite sides of our central atom. So they can go in the axial positions here. So they're complete opposite ends. And then we have the fluorines around the xenon. So now we have four bonds, two lone pairs. This is a square planar molecular shape. So the other thing to take note of here is it doesn't matter too much where those lone pairs of electrons go there. As long as they're on opposite sides, all the bond angles are about the same size. You don't have the axial position having a, high, a lower bond angle than the equatorial for the, square, for the square planar or for the octahedral. They're all about 90 degrees. So we're going to briefly talk about the molecular structure for multi-centered molecules. We're not going to go super in depth here. We are only talking about the central, they're the local geometries. So not every molecule has one central atom with however many going around it. A lot of times you have molecules that have more than one central atom because they, maybe they have a chain of atoms bonded together. Uh, for those of you when, that are going to be moving on to organic chemistry, you will be seeing this. So we're going to, though, focus on just the local geometries of the multiple central atoms. And this will make more sense with an example. So this is the simplest amino acid, glycine. And we notice that there are one, two, three, four atoms, four central atoms here. And each one of these atoms has its own geometry about it. So we're going to go through these ones independently. So the first thing is we're given the Lewis structure already. So if we start by looking at the nitrogen here, we see we have three single bonds and one lone pair of electrons. So it's electron density. Okay, it has a tetrahedral electron density and then that one lone pair gives it a trigonal pyramidal uh, local structure or molecular structure okay molecular local we're kind of using those interchangeably I'm going to call this carbon one and carbon two don't come at me for those of you that know how to number and name things in organic chemistry for carbon one, we see four single bonds around it. So it has a tetrahedral electron density and a tetrahedral shape, since it doesn't have any lone pairs. So that should be EP, not ED. For carbon number two, we see it has two single bonds one double bond, so it has three electron dense areas around it, 
giving it a trigonal planar shape or electron de um, pair repulsion, uh, electron pair geometry, and no lone pairs. So it's trigonal planar both ways. So this is trigonal planar, electron pair geometry has, has the three regions, no lone pairs gives it also a trigonal planar molecular shape or local structure, whatever you want to call it. And then lastly, the oxygen. We have two single bonds, two lone pairs. This gives it a tetrahedral electron pair geometry. Those two lone pairs on it, however, give, with the two single bonds, gives it a bent local structure or molecular structure, however you want to write it. So then the 3D structure looks like the one on the right with the wedge dash. Now that we have talked and talked and talked about 3D structures, molecular structures, and electron pair geometries, we're going to talk about molecular polarity and dipole moments. So if you remember earlier in chapter seven, we talked about covalent bonds having partial positive and negative charges when the electrons are unequally shared. And this is called a bond dipole moment. And we can represent it with the character mu. You can actually calculate the magnitude of this by multiplying the magnitude of the partial charges by the distance between them. So mu equals Q times R. So one thing about bond moment is that it is a vector and vectors have direction and magnitude and they are give, vectors are represented with arrows. So if I have a vector going to the right and it's that size, that size vector is going to the right. The size does matter. So the way that we show vectors and dipoles for bonds is we have an arrow in our vector that is pointing to the more electronegative atom and the less electronegative side or the partial negative side kind of has this little plus sign at the tail of the arrow. Here's a couple examples of dipoles. So carbon and hydrogen have a small electronegative, electronegativity difference, but there is a very small dipole there. So you see this kind of small vector, and then you see the arrow pointing towards the carbon that is the more electronegative atom, and then the hydrogen has the partial positive charge. Boron and fluorine have a much larger electronegativity difference. So you have a bigger vector here, fluorine being the much more electronegative atom, boron being more with the partial positive. So these are what these dipole arrows represent. So those are just for bonds, but molecules themselves can have charge separation depending on the molecular shape and the polarity of each bond. If there is overall separation of charges in your molecule, you have a polar molecule. If there's overall no separation, you have a nonpolar molecule. We have what is called a dipole moment uh, by measuring the net charge separation in a molecule as a whole by adding all the different bond, uh, bond moments in that molecule. So when you have a molecule with more than two atoms in it, so not diatomic molecules, they only have one bond, so that di one bond dipole determines the molecule's polarity. But in a molecule with more than one bond, you take all those different um, bond moments and you add them up. And you also have to take geometry into account when you do this. And I'm gonna talk about the easiest way to do this. Now in big caps I have here, just because a molecule has polar bonds does not mean it is a polar molecule. And you will see what I mean as we go along. So here is how to do vector addition um, 
you really don't need to for this class, but if you want to really see how the vectors can either cancel or add together, we use what is called the head to tail method of adding vectors. So you take all your dipole arrows and you take whatever your starting one is, and then you take the next one and you take the tail of the next one, attach it to the head of the first, and then the area that is left over, this green R that's being highlighted by the GIF, is your uh, net dipole if you have one. But for something like carbon dioxide, what ends up happening is you have two bond moments between the carbon and oxygen on either side of it, but these dipoles are vectors that are the same size but opposite directions. So when you have this happening, if you do the head to tail method, I draw my first dipole and then I go, okay, I take the tail of the next one and I'm going just in the opposite direction, huh? they cancel each other out. So there's no net dipole. So just because you have polar bonds does not mean you have a polar molecule. So carbon dioxide is nonpolar. Whereas water, you have two bond moments happening between the oxygen and the hydrogens. And if we were to do the head to tail addition here, we have our first dipole arrow here, and then I take my second one, take the tail of it, put it on the head of the first, and our, we have an overall then dipole moment attaching this head and this tail together. This is our overall dipole moment. So let's go a different color here. So this is the overall dipole moment. So since there is an overall dipole, this is a polar molecule. Now something like methane or CH4, or actually instead of CH4, let's do CCl4. And I'm just gonna go basic here and do a basic Lewis structure instead of doing the perfect bond angles. Um, but if you were to look at this, you have four dipoles all in equal size. And if you do the head to tail method, there's one and then we have one going down, the next one going this way. We see that our starting and ending position is the same, meaning overall we went nowhere. So this is zero net dipole when our last head and tail meet. The other way you can think about this, looking at the 3D structure when you have a wedge and dash, they're going in exact opposite directions. So these two chlorines cancel each other out because they're going in opposite directions. One com is coming out towards us, one's going away. So these dipoles cancel each other out. And then the two that are on the page also are going in opposite directions and they cancel each other out as well. So again, zero net dipole. So when you have a tetrahedral molecule with identical bonds, so you have identical atoms all around it, it's going to overall be nonpolar, even if the bonds are polar. Here's another example of this, this structure here. Um, we have two bond moments between the carbon and oxygen and the carbon sulfur. But the carbon oxygen moment is much stronger than the carbon sulfur. So even if we go and we add the sulfur to this guy, okay, we take its magnitude, put it like there, we still have an overall dipole moment. So this is still an overall polar molecule. Chloromethane. Okay, this is tetrahedral here. You have this central carbon and you have some interesting uh, bonds going on here. You have some slightly polar carbon hydrogen bonds that are more or less nonpolar, but then you have a much more polar carbon chlorine bond. So when you end up adding all these dipoles together, we end up with an overall dipole moment going up 
and this is an overall polar molecule. A lot of times when you have a molecule that is symmetrical, it tends to be nonpolar because it has that overall dipole moment of zero. However, you can still have polar uh, molecules even if they're symmetrical because of things like lone pairs of electrons and very strong dipole moments. Um, some examples here are hydrogen sulfide and ammonia. So H2S here, it's actually, we're being told it's not, it's not a linear structure. This is a bent structure with the two single bonds and two lone pairs. So our dipole moments are going into the sulfur and they are equal in size, but if we go ahead and add them up, there's one, we take our other one, we go here, and then our overall dipole moment is this going towards the sulfur. So we have over, an overall dipole. Next, looking at ammonia, NH3 here. We have three identical dipoles going in towards the nitrogen. But if we go and add these up, let's start with this guy here, and then this guy. And then this guy, we have an overall moment here. Kind of a weird, weirder looking moment, but that's okay. All right, my pen battery is low, as everybody has seen now. <laughs> So let's end this by talking about some properties of polar molecules. If you take some polar molecules and put them in an electric field, they're actually going to align with each other, where the positive end of the molecule is pointed towards the negative plate, and the negative end of the molecule points towards the positive plate. And we have this saying of like dissolves like. So polar solvents tend to dissolve polar substances and nonpolar solvents tend to dissolve nonpolar substances. This is why oil and water don't mix. Oil is nonpolar, whereas water is polar. This is why sugar dissolves in water, but it doesn't dissolve in oil. Okay, sugar is more polar. So those are just a couple examples for you. And this is just a drawing showing what's going to happen if you take some polar molecules and stick them in an electric field. And that does it for chapter seven. I hope you guys somewhat enjoyed it and learned a lot from it. As usual, if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask, and I will see you soon.